Good morning and welcome to all of you that are here, as well as to those of you that may be listening to us live online or on re replay. The Lord says, God bless you. I'm here. And so is Samu. My son and my daughter-in-law decided to surprise me. And on Friday, I almost really would say Saturday morning at 2 a.m., look who showed up. And I'd like to introduce you all to Samu, and he has a, has a Japanese mama, and so therefore, I am Baba to this little boy. So let's go before the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, we just praise you and we thank you. This morning, we praise you and we thank you for new life as represented in a little child. We can see the innocence, and then we can hear Jesus's words to each of us, be like a little child. Come to me. And he says, come to me, all you little children. But yet he says, come to me, all you children. You're all my children. So this morning, Lord, as we go forward in a time of worship and a time of prayer and a time of listening to your word and hearing what you've laid upon Pastor Scott's heart to share with us today, Lord, we say we thank you, Lord God, that we're here. We thank you, Lord God, that you're in our life. We thank you, Lord God, for sending your son. We thank you, Lord God, for the presence of your Holy Spirit. We lift up to you this morning those that are not well. We lift up to you this morning those that are not well physically, those that are not well spiritually, and those that are not well emotionally, Lord God. You know about them all. And we've been seeing, we've been seeing, Lord, you work. We've, we've been seeing your miracles, Lord, and we praise you and we thank you for that. So today, Lord, we say we give it all to you as we go forward in this time of service and worship. It's in your holy and precious name, Lord Jesus, that we believe and we pray. Amen. Good morning, everyone. So we all survived yesterday's storm, I see. Um, and uh, I know uh, with my family, we were making lots of trips back and forth to the airport to drop people off, pick people up. But uh, anyway, let's start out. If you wouldn't mind standing with me, let's start out. Let's sing this song about being redeemed. Uh, how blessed are we that the Lord did the things that he did that make us redeemed people? Redeemed how I love to proclaim it Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb Redeemed through His infinite mercy His child and forever I am Redeemed, redeemed Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb Child and forever I am. Redeemed and so happy in Jesus, no language my rapture can tell. I know that the light of his presence with me to continually dwell. I think of my blessed Redeemer, I think of Him all the day long. I sing for I cannot be silent, His love is the theme of my song. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed, His child that forever I am. I know I shall see in his beauty The king in whose law I delight With whom we guarded my footsteps And giveth me song in the night Redeemed, redeemed Redeemed by 
the blood of the Lamb. Redeem, redeem, this child that forever I am. Redeem, redeem, redeem by the blood of the Lamb. His child and forever I am. It's going to be a little slower I'd, during practice, my capo. It's spring-loaded, and some of you will get a, a, a short prize, a little cup of coffee, if you find the spring that actually shot out from underneath it. So if you want to play a game a little later on, <laughs> just look under your seat and see if you find it. <laughs> I'm trading my sorrow. And I'm trading my shame. I'm laying them down for the joy of the Lord. I'm trading my sickness. I'm trading my pain. I'm laying them down for the joy of the Lord. So I say, Yes, Lord, yes. Lord, yes, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord, amen. I oppressed but not crushed, persecuted but not abandoned, struck down but not destroyed. I am blessed beyond the curse, for his promise will be more. That is, joy is going to be my strength. Though the sorrow may last for the night, his joy comes with the morning. I'm trading my sorrow. I'm trading my shame. I'm laying it down for the joy of the Lord. And I'm trading my sickness, I'm trading my pain, I'm laying them down for the joy of the Lord. So I say, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord, amen. I am pressed but not crushed, persecuted but not abandoned, struck down but not destroyed. I am blessed beyond the curse, for his promise will endure that his joys can be my strength. Though the sorrow may last for the night, his joy comes in the morning. I'm dreaming. Don't be afraid. Well, sha la 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 sha la 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 sha la 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 amen.
The other one, you just squeeze and put it on. This one, you open it up, you put it on. You hold it in place, you straighten it up. <laughs> but it's a whole lot better than the one I wouldn't have, isn't it? So <laughs> well, we're small, we're, but we're mighty up here. We're, we're missing Johnny, we're missing Mauricio, we're missing Dawn. And I'm missing my spring. <laughs> on spring break <laughs> there's spring break when you're in school there's break spring and that's mine was mine's on break spring it's a little different yeah it's To the Lord, our God and King, His love endures forever. For He is good, He is above all things. His love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise. With a mighty hand and outstretched arm, His love endures forever. And for the life that's been reborn, His love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise, sing praise, sing praise. Forever, God is faithful. Forever, God is strong. Forever, God is with us. Forever. Forever. From the rising to the setting sun, His love endures forever. By the grace we'll carry on, His love endures forever. about you guys, but um, I can honestly say that all my hope is in Jesus. Um, I could tell you I f fail way more than I succeed, and I can't even imagine why he would care about me, why he would do the things that he's done. 
but he is my hope. And so this song is all about hope. And it's a, not, uh, it's a little different song. It's not exactly a congregational song, but I hope a lot of you like it. And I'm really praying that a lot of you sing along with me. Um, so let's, let's, let's worship God with this, okay? Offering first. Oh, but first, the offering. <laughs> www.clintonnazarene.org. If you're at home or if you're watching later or whenever you're watching at home and you would like to contribute, that is the uh, uh, place that you would go to, www.clintonnazarene.org. And if you are here and you have your tithe and offering or are visiting or would just like to contribute, what have you, you may come up during this song. Did I get it, Dave? You got it. Thanks. You ready to go? And I've been held by the Savior. I've felt fire from above. I've been down to that river. Whoa. I ain't the same, a prodigal return. And all my hope is in Jesus. Thank God my yesterday is gone, yes it is, and all my sins are forgiven, yeah, and I've been washed by the blood. I'm no stranger to the prison. I've worn shackles and chains. I've been freed and forgiven. Yes, I have. I'm not going back. I'll never be the same. That's why I'm singing, oh, my hope is in Jesus. Thank God. My yesterday's gone, yes, it's gone, and all my sins are forgiven. Whoa, and I've been washed by the blood. There's a kind of thing that'll break a man. Break him down to his knees. God, I've been broken more than a time or two. Yes, Lord. And then he picked me up and showed me what it means to be a man. That's why I'm singing, oh, my hope is in Jesus. Thank God, my Yesterday's gone, it's long gone, and all my sins are forgiven. Oh, and I've been washed by his blood, and all my hope is in Jesus. Thank God that yesterday's gone. All my sins are forgiven. Oh, and I've been washed by the blood. I've been washed by the blood. And I've been washed by his blood. Yes, I have.
And now, from all the way in the back to all the way in the front, it's Melinda with Kids Connection. Come on down, kids. Wow, nice to see. Emma has grown like, like a weed, so she's super tall. And we have baby Samu. Oh, he's so cute. Oh, he's so cute. <laughs> we have baby Phoebe. We have baby Phoebe. Yeah, she's here. We have Melanie and Shyla. I'm, I'm so glad you are all here. So, you know what is Thursday? Anybody know? I'll give you a hint. Look what color I'm wearing. St. Patrick's Day. That's right. So I figure we'll do it before instead of after because, you know, who wants to celebrate something after next Sunday, right? So we're going to continue it downstairs in Children's Church. But I thought we'd just do a little story about St. Patrick. He's a really fascinating guy. You know, he was born, I think, in the year 385 AD. So not a long, long time after Jesus, right? And do you know, as a boy, he was born in England. And as a boy, he was captured, I guess, by pirates, they're saying. Pirates. And they took him to to, to um, Ireland. And he was sort of a, he was sort of a slave servant, right? He had to do what they said. And he uh, tended a lot of their, their flocks and do a lot of the farming for these, um, these pirates or these people. And, you know, he was there for several years. And then I guess he got a little older and he escaped back to his home in England. And, you know, I guess God was really working in his heart. And, you know, he said, I want to go back to Ireland and tell them about God. And do you know, he even became a priest. He went through all the things that they needed to do to become a priest. And he went back to Ireland. And he, because he had such a love for the people there. You know that it says that he established all kinds of churches he baptized thousands of people and, you know, he um, had other priests, right? Help other people become priests, different things like that. And, you know, the neatest thing about St. Patrick, there's a lot of great things about him, but he wanted to teach them about the Trinity. And like, we, 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 we talk about leprechauns and good luck and all those kinds of things that are cute stuff about St. Patrick's Day. But the real thing is, does anybody know what it's called? Whirly clover? Yeah. Shamrock. There are lots of, yeah. So, you know, he took, there's tons of them and we have a lot of them in the United States too, but there's Ireland's full of them, right? So he took one of, one of these and he held it up and he taught them about the Trinity of God, right? So he said, see how there's three, God, the father, we'll do a craft with this. You guys will actually be putting all this in God, the father, God, the son, and God, the Holy spirit, one clover leaf, one shamrock, but three parts of the same God. Right. So he was, because uh, he was trying to teach them so they'd understand, right. He, um, there's a, there's several famous things that he's written um, uh, about Christ. So it's Christ before me, Christ behind me, Christ to my right, Christ to my left, Christ above me, Christ below me. That's one of the parts of one of the things, because he knew that Christ was the center of everything. He wanted every part around him to say, right, that Christ was super important. So I think, wow, he was a pretty smart guy, right? He went to like a seminary of those days and did a lot of things, but he had such a heart for people. 
And maybe even some of those people that didn't treat them well. Now, most of the people in Ireland didn't treat them bad. It was the ones that had taken them into slavery, right? I wonder if he met any of those. It'd be neat if he talked to them about who God was, right? And I think what a heart he had for people that he didn't want to stay in his country where he was born. He wanted to go back and be and teach people about who God was and tell them. And so I think that we can have that same heart for people, even your ages, right? You guys can have a heart for people that they come to know who God is, right? God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, right? So that's what I was thinking when I was thinking about talking about St. Patrick, how we can be, we can be like him, right? And tell other people and show them, show them God's love. Okay. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, we thank you so much for um, the example of St. Patrick, how he devoted his life to teaching people about who you are. So we just pray that you give us the strength, even when we're fearful or we're not, we're unsure that you would help us um, to show God's love to other people, to tell them about who you are and the difference that you make in our lives. So we say thank you again, Jesus, for this um, wonderful story and example and how much he, he loved you. Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. We have several announcements this morning. Um, the children's ministry is going to meet today um, after service. So if you have an interest in what's happening there, we're, we'll talk a little bit more in a moment about uh, Easter extravaganza, but it's really more than that. We're getting ready for um, the summertime and our, our VBS. So please do stay. Um, there's a lot that people can do without it being too much. And as we always say, many hands make light work. And most of all, in your, include in your prayers, the people and the, the parents and the children that'll be here for both Easter and this coming summertime. So 1145 today, just it's like after service, go get a cup of coffee, a little something to eat, and then join Melinda back up here. Also, um, something that's very important uh, for you to note in your calendars is that on Sunday, the 29th of March, we're going to be um, having what we call our annual church or congregational meeting and everyone is welcome. It's not a members only or, you know, anything like that, because Pastor Scott will bring forward his report for 2021, will reaffirm the board members and a financial report will be um, available. So please plan to stay on that Sunday. What we'll do again is we'll Close service, and then we'll go right into the meeting. Um, now, so here we are with Easter extravaganza on the 16th of uh, April, which is Saturday, is when we're going to be here. And then, and there are, including the planning session today, there is a a um, prep. There will be prep sessions. So if you could think about April 3rd, planning to stay after church, we're going to be loading. 1600 eggs for the egg hunt so we need all the hands and feet that we can hands in this case um, that we can utilize in order to be able to just get that portion of what we do on that day ready and then we will also um, on the 15th of april which will um, be followed by a good friday service or before we haven't exactly figured the time for the good friday service yet we will be doing the rest of the prep which those of you that are aware we completely break down the sanctuary to make it make it uh, kid friendly for that day 
Um, very important coming up on the 29th of April and sign up is needed so that you can get the early discounts is the New Jersey Right to Life Banquet. And there's there are flyers out there. I know you can't really read what's up here, but there's flyers out there if you just want to go out and read what's happening. And there's also a sign up sheet. And so there, we're going to go forward with the word of God. Now, when Paul and his party, it's Barnabas and John Mark, set sail from Paphos, they came to Perga in Pamph Pamphylia, and John departed from them and returned to Jerusalem. But when they, that's Paul and Barnabas, departed from Perga, they came to Antioch in Pisidia and went on into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. And after the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent to them, saying, men and brothers, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say on, then Paul stood up to preach, and motioning with his hand said, men of Israel, Jews, and who you who fear God, the Gentiles, listen to me. The God of this people, Israel, chose our fathers and exalted the people when they dwelt as strangers in the land of Egypt. And with an uplifted arm, he brought them out of it. Now for a time of about 40 years, he sustained you and put up with their ways, their disobedience and rebellion in the wilderness. And when God had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan. He distributed their promised land to them by allotment. And after that, God gave them judges for about 450 years until Samuel, the prophet. And afterwards, they asked for a king. So God gave them Saul, the king of Kish, and a man of the tribe of Benjamin for 40 years. And when he had removed Saul, he raised up for them David as king, to whom also he gave testimony to saying, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do all my will. And from this man's seed, that's David, according to the promise God, raised up for Israel, a savior, Jesus, the word of the Lord. There's one more handout for you there at the back. You can pick up two or at the meeting. It's what you can still purchase and bring for either candy, food, or prizes for the Easter extravaganza. Okay, a lot to do today. It's a setup for a four-part message. So here we go. I will move along as quickly as I can this morning, but there's a lot to do to get a setup. So let's start. First thing I want to talk to you about is this handout right here. We'll be using this to look at this series of questions for the next four weeks. <clears throat> a couple of questions here. Why do we do what we do? And what is the expected outcome of what we do? What do I mean by that? As Christians, why do we do what we do? I guess first question is, what, what do we do? And isn't that our mission to go out and tell the whole world the good news that we've been set free? Amen? Set free in mind, set free in body, set free in spirit by Christ who has set us free. For the one that the Son sets free is free indeed. That, that's what we do. And we're commanded to do it. It's not a request. But we should also want to do it out of the love of our own heart if we really know what we've been truly saved from. Yes? Amen? So what is the expected outcome if we do that? Well, what, what is the expected outcome from God's perspective? Anybody? that others would be set free too, right? Isn't that also kind of the motto of America? Or supposed to be? We're supposed to be a people who are what? Free. Not free to do whatever we want to do, but free to worship God and free to love one another and free to serve one another. Freedom always comes with a responsibility, does it not? And so does it with Christ. So let's take a look at these questions. Central question and answers for all of chapter 13 as we look at it about preaching and teaching the full gospel message. Question number one, what is the outcome when the true followers of God, that's you and I, testify and witness to the full gospel message of the good news to others? 
Well, what do we expect that outcome to be? There's five different outcomes. Here they are. Some people will become curious about God. Some people will become curious about eternal life and what happens after this life is over. <clears throat> so when the Jews went out of the synagogue, at the end of this whole message, we're going to get to this, the Gentiles begged that the gospel might be preached to them again the next week as well. That's, that's curiosity, right? The first time they hear it, what do they ask for? Can we get some more? Have you ever been to a place where there's really, really good food? You go over to somebody's house and, and, and then you're, you're a little like, maybe, maybe I shouldn't ask, but boy, that was good. Could I just have some more? Um, the other day we were out with the, with the teens and we had tacos, right? At, uh, at Judy's house. And you know, I waited and waited to make sure the kids had enough. This is when I was actually eating food <laughs> before I got sick here. But, um, and then uh, I said, boy, those are good. I said, Mike, you got more. He had plenty. So we had more tacos. But some people will ask for more. These people you want to invest in, okay? Because they've given you the permission to invest back in them. All right. Next one. Some people will become convicted of their sin and of their condition in life. And they'll make a decision to follow Jesus Christ just as you have when you present the gospel to them. Here's the next verse we'll read towards the end of this. Now, when the congregation had all broken up, many of the Jews and the devout proselytes, that's those who had converted over to Judaism from, from being Gentiles, followed Paul and Barnabas where they went. And they spoke to them and, and they persuaded them to continue on in the grace of God. So Paul and Barnabas then encourage and teach and uplift and train these people to be, to be good disciples. A third response, though, if you present the gospel, will be this. New believers immediately begin to also testify and witness themselves. Have you ever noticed a new Christian? They're amazing. They're, they're so on fire for God. And you know what? I often wonder, why don't I always feel that way? I should, shouldn't I? I should be experiencing the joy of my salvation every day. But the new ones are out there, and they're out there in force. On the very next Sabbath, Almost the whole city came together to hear the word of God. Well, listen, Paul and Barnabas only spoke to a small group. So how did the whole city turn out? Because the rest of them went and did what? Told them the good news. They were being set free. So that's another response you can expect. Believers begin to be filled with the Holy Spirit and with the joy of salvation. You'll expect this to happen too when you see new people come to Christ. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. We're going to see this over this next four parts, that this is how, the, how it goes. Now, what do you think the fifth response is? Anybody? Before I put it up there? Yeah, yeah, thumbs down. The rejection, that's right. People who, not only do they reject, they persecute. See, people don't like the truth. They don't like it at all. <clears throat> Yesterday, the, the, you know, President uh, Duda of Poland basically told President Putin, what he, what he could do. I won't say it here in church. Um, and uh, he sent fighter planes from Poland to back up the Ukrainian Air Force losses. He provoked a war. This morning, while we're sitting here about 25 minutes ago, a whole bunch of missiles went off right on the Polish-Ukrainian border. It's Putin firing back saying, I know what you did, and I'm this close to provoking war with you. We're in a big conflict, folks. We need to start really praying. This thing is getting a little bit bigger by the second, okay? It's uh, reminiscent of World War II. And so what happens? You get provoked, okay? And people don't like it. They don't like it because the Polish people are saying what's really going on. They're watching it. And they're telling the world what's really happening inside the Ukraine. And those that are of the evil do not want that to go out. And it's the same with you. If you go out and speak the good news of the gospel, people are going to get right in your face, trust me. They're going to tell you to be quiet. They're going to tell you to shut up. They're going to tell you all kinds of things. They want to silence you because you are about to what? Set a soul free for eternity. Way more important than any battle or war going on in the physical realm. And so lo and behold, this will happen also. But when the Jews, those religious and secular authorities, saw the multitude streaming to the new faith, they were filled with envy. See, when people lose their power over other people, what do they experience? Envy. And they began to contradict 
and the blaspheme the truth. And they oppose the things, the truths of the gospel spoken by Paul. So you can also expect this if you're out there preaching because people will get right in your face. All right. So there's our background. I want you to think about these questions as we go through the next four parts of the message and look for them every place you can see them. And then practice it this week and see how many responses you can get. That's the good part. That's it. It's like a little experiment. Part one, Paul's full gospel teaching. Now, there's no better chapter other than chapter six when Stephen preached or chapter 27 and 28 at the very end of Acts when Paul preaches again to see how to present the gospel in all of its fullness than right here in chapter 13. So if you want to spend some time, study this chapter. There are so many clues on how to tell the full story. And some of you come to me and say, how can I tell it better? How can I tell it more fully? How can I tell it more regularly? Study. One of the things you got to do is study. I was a teacher before and kids don't want to hear that and neither do adults, but you got to put in the hard work. So the first part is entitled preparation for the coming of Christ in the past. So where does Paul start in the past? Tell the history of the earth. Tell the history of God and his people. Start at the beginning. You don't know how many people don't know any of this stuff. I watched some documentaries on the Ukraine, for an example, this week. And people go back and say, well, you know, around 1900, hogwash, try 1290. If you don't start in 1290, you don't even know what the Ukraine's about. You don't know what that whole area of the world is about. Go back and study eight or 900 years of history, and then let's talk, okay? Today, we hear things like, well, it was just made up in the 20th century, so it's not really a legitimate country. Can you imagine us then with Britain? Uh, who did we break away from? And did we declare ourselves to be a new nation in, seven, in 1783, 1789? Yes, we did. So that would make us what? Illegitimate too. Do we think we're illegitimate? Every nation, you see, was never a nation before they became a nation, yes? So we need to know the history of the Christian faith if we're going to tell it, too. So you got to do a lot of studying. So here we go. Who set sail from Paphos on the island of Cyprus, where we left him in the hotbed of the sorcerers last week? And where does he go? To Perga of Pamphylia and Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, everybody. Paul and Barnabas, John, Mark are the ones that set out. Now, when Paul and his party, Barnabas and John, Mark, set sail from Paphos on the south side of the island of Cyprus, they sailed to Perga in Pamphylia, who departs immediately upon arriving. Scripture tells us one of them departs, John Mark. He went back to Jerusalem and back to the council. At this time, we don't know why. Later, we'll find out some more things. Let's recall, who is John Mark? Why do I want to bring him up? He's important. He's Barnabas's cousin. Read Colossians 4.10. He also has a, con a, 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 con a contentious split between Paul and Barnabas occur over him. It's later fixed, and there's later restoration and unity. But in Acts chapter 15, we'll see a big split between Paul and Barnabas over John Mark. Later, though, when John Mark gets his life right, he writes the Gospel of Mark, named after him. And it's an interview with uh, Simon Peter. So if we, when you're reading the Gospel of Mark, think about that. All right, after landing in Paragraph Pamphylia, this is the second part of Paul's first missionary journey. What does Paul and Barnabas do next? Well, they go into a town called <clears throat> Pisidian Antioch. Excuse me, I'm sorry, I have a very dry throat. And when they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch of Pisidia. Now, why is this important? <clears throat> because it's another Antioch. Who remembers we studied this? This is forever referred to as Antioch of Pisidia, or better yet, Pisidian Antioch. So you can distinguish that between the other Antioch, the large city in the Middle East. In the Middle East. And so here's a map, and you can look on your, on your chart there. But here's the regular Antioch over here on the Bay of Eskederon. Paul's from Tarsus. He, he, was, he was teaching here. Then he went down to to Cyprus and Pamphus, and from Paphos up to Perga, and then to Pisidian Antioch, which is up here in the middle of modern day Turkey today. Now, what do you think is important about that time? Well, we're gonna to get to it. 
So from Paphos on the island of Cyprus to the Sea of Perga of Pamphylia, he sails 175 miles across the Mediterranean. Then he walks 119 miles overland to get to the town. These are big journeys. <clears throat> Anybody ever walk 120 miles? Okay, I walked 100 one summer um, with the 10th Mountain Division. We, we, we marched the Appalachian Trail to get back to camp. And we, we marched 100 miles in five days. Have you ever traveled over mountains 20 miles at a time in boots with uh, 90, 90 pounds on your back? That's uh, quite a journey. Trust me, that was in my earlier days. I probably couldn't do it today. Good foot care, lots of rest at night, lots of dry socks, and a second change of boots is what's needed, and a good constitution. This is all mountainous terrain. This 120 miles would not be easy. And by the way, there's brigands and people along the road who want to do you no good the full journey. So it's a big journey. What's the significance, though, of choosing Antioch, Pisidia? Well, let's take a look. It's the largest trade city of commerce and law and military outpost linking all of the Roman provinces of Galatia, Lycia, Pamphylia, Sicilia, and all of Syria. So you can imagine how important this town is. You have five large provinces and they're all linked together by the trade routes and the commercial routes and the law enforcement and the military uh, garrisons in this area. So in the, in the modern world, it'd be very, very, very important. It's kind of like what, it's kind of like maybe in the going west, Kansas City, Missouri. Everybody can kind of see the importance of that, right? The wagon trains coming in and coming out back in the old days. All right, that's kind of an equivalent. Thus, preaching and teaching in this city would give a quick delivery of the gospel where? Every point east and every point west in the entire Roman Empire. How important is this town? It's huge. Paul makes his way there because the Holy Spirit tells him and Barnabas, this is where you must go. Go to the epicenter of everything. After arriving at Pisidia Antioch, what do Paul and Barnabas do according to the Jewish heritage and ritual on the Sabbath day? They follow the rules. They go to church. They enter the local synagogue and they await an opportunity to preach, teach, or debate. But they go through everything first that they should do by being quiet. So Paul and Barnabas come into Antioch. They go into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and they sit down among the men. Note. An opportunity is presented for them to share the gospel because they're following along in tradition. After the reading of the law and after the reading of the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent to them and said, men and brothers, if you have any word of exhortation for us this day on this Saturday of Sabbath, would you tell us now, please? Say on, we're listening. Well, I'll tell you what, after saying that to Paul, I bet you they were wishing they hadn't because that's like an open invitation to tell the whole deal, and so he does. Paul immediately teaches and preaches the full gospel to all the Jews and all the Gentiles gathered. He stands up, he motions with his hand, quiet. Men of Israel, my fellow Jews, and those who fear God, my fellow Gentiles, listen to me now what I say next. So there, he's got everybody's attention. So, before we actually look at what he says, I want to review with you, because we did this in chapter two, we did this in chapter four, and we did this in chapter six. What does the full message of the gospel of the good news look like? And you can study this this week. The church has an evangelical mission on earth today, you and I, to do two main things. Number one, we preach. We proclaim and we share. That's what preaching is, the full good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And in that, there are seven sequential acts of full faith and truth that need to come out. Then we teach. Once we get people's attention, we educate, and we, and, and we offer up our service to, to the people to mentor them and to train them. And these also have seven sequential acts of salvation involved in action. So let's look at preaching the complete news first. What are the seven? Number one. You teach Christ has come and lived among us, and he lived a perfect life. Number two, you teach Christ has truly died and has truly risen from the dead. Number three, you teach Christ has ascended into heaven 
and is now making intercession for all of us in prayer every minute of the day. Number four, you teach Christ has sent his Holy Spirit back to earth to live inside and guide us into all truth by living within each and every believer. Number five, Christ has entrusted us with preaching, repentance, and forgiveness of sins in his name. And all this is in the notes, so you don't need to write anything. Christ has asked us to serve others and teach them everything that he has taught us. That's what teachers do. Christ shall come again to judge the living and the dead and take us back to heaven to live with him for all eternity, forever and ever. That is the seven things that must be preached if you're going to tell a person the full good news of their salvation and their freedom. Now, what are the seven things if you're going to educate further in teaching? Number one, you need to have to teach them about an age of fulfillment becoming a reality. What does that mean? That the times that were predicted have come true. And how do we know? Because they're signs and wonders. People are healed and healed fully. Things happen when people pray. Number two, the ancient prophecies of the Old Testament are fulfilled in Christ in the New Testament. So the old is fulfilled in the new. And you also teach them that some of the prophecies are still yet to come to pass, but they may be coming past as we speak. Number three, proclamation. You must preach and teach the good news to the people on a regular basis. Want to forward that one for me? I got it. Call to repentance. You must have a call to repentance for people so that they can honor what Christ has done for them in the sacrifice. They must have an opportunity to turn from their sin. Reception and forgiveness of sins. You must teach them that only in Christ they can be forgiven. A call to surrender their will to God's will for the rest of their life. An ongoing thing each day that a person is willing to turn their will over to Christ again and again. Number seven, a call to holiness and change of life and service for his name. And that's all that life's about after that. Serving others, serving him in holiness. You can go back and look at all these things, but there it is. So now, how does Paul do it? When we're reading this chapter 13, what do we look for? He uses a four-part formula, and he does it over and over and over, and he never varies from it. And by the way, he's wildly successful. So why invent, reinvent the wheel, right? If it's there, let's follow it. Let's take a look at what he does. Number one, I'm going to teach you a new word today, kerygma. Good Greek word. What does it mean? History and faith and events and all things put together into a story so that they have a nice, neat little package to present to somebody so they can see the full truth. It's a central story, and the kerygma must have in it deliverance and salvation. God must act, and the people must respond. That's what a kerygma is. So we're going to look at how God's plans and promises have always been there and how people have responded in the Old Testament. Then we're going to do the same thing with the New Testament. Now the story has gone further because Christ has come. How does that central story of deliverance and salvation look like now that Jesus is here? And again, how do the people find fulfillment in that in Christ? Three, he supports everything he does with other scripture. So he spends a lot of time reading. He'll eventually end up spending a lot of time writing new scripture, but he spends a lot of time with God's word. If we're not spending a lot of time with God's word, how can we support anything? We have no ammunition, right? Think of your ammo as loading verses. Think of your ammo as loading knowledge. Think of your ammo as loading truth in, into the weapon of the gospel. So you're going to use lots of scripture to support everything you're saying. Finally, Paul uses the fourth part of his plan. He exhorts and tells people the truth, and he doesn't apologize at all. He's very bold. But then he encourages people right where they are. If they're only part of the way and curious, he brings them along. If they're ready to make a decision, he's there to help them make that decision for Christ. If they're there to get baptized, he's there to baptize. If they're there to, to have the baptism of the Holy Spirit and go deep into holiness, he brings them into holiness. 
whatever's necessary, he encourages where they are. And you know what he tells them? If you don't have it all figured out yet, keep studying, spend time with God, and you'll get there. Okay? But don't stand still. Learn. Move on. Exhort. Encourage. You can do this. Okay? How many people like that plan? Pretty good plan, isn't it? It sounds pretty good. All right. Let's move on. We can. Ancient Jewish tradition is to have three readings on the Sabbath day. If you go to a Catholic church this morning, you'll see an ancient tradition being repeated. There'll be three readings. You know what they'll be? They'll be from the Old Testament someplace, and then there'll be one from the Psalms, okay, or Psalm response from the Old Testament, and then there'll be a gospel reading of the New Testament, or there'll be an Old Testament reading, a New Testament reading from one of the epistles that Paul or Peter or John wrote, and then you'll hear the gospel. Very, very ancient tradition. The Jews used it too. But they always read from a series of three sets of books because their Bible was broken into three sets. And the sets were, number one, the law, the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch or the Torah. Number two, they would read from one of the historical books. Number three, they would read from one of the poetry books or something else or one of the other minor prophets, the 12 at the end of the book. And they read it in a three-year cycle, just like in the Catholic Church today. It's read, the whole scripture is read in a three-year cycle. So they would read the law, they would read the prophets, and then they would choose something to support the other two. And this reading would be written down in a missal or a book that could be followed. So lo and behold, on that Sabbath morning in Pisidian Antioch, when Paul and Barnabas sat down for the morning service, just like you're listening to me this morning, they read scriptures from those books. And th that day, it was already prescribed what to read. And by the way, you can go home and you can read these. And I would if I was you. I would read all of what was written that morning that was read on that day when he stood there. Because you'll see what Paul was listening to. And you'll see where Paul started. And guess where he started? From one of the readings. He actually chose one of the phrases in, in Deuteronomy and one in the prophets from Samuel. And he used it to craft the whole gospel story. That's how well he knew the scripture. Pretty amazing stuff. So the people heard it in context as well. No, let's see how many of the preaching and teaching points of the full gospel you and I can identify this morning in the short time we have left. Now we're going to get into the meat of what he said. We're going to follow this for four weeks using this formula. Let's see what we can pick out and see what we can learn. Then let's ask ourselves later in the week a question about what we're learning. Can I identify more than I heard on Sunday morning from Pastor Scott or what I was thinking right when I was sitting there? And can I use the stuff I've learned this week to share with somebody this week the truth? How about that? Actually use what we learned. Wouldn't that be a, a, a kind of a novel idea? You know, I love it when you learn all this stuff in school, but if you don't put it into practice, what good does it do you, right? And my kids would always say the same thing, science, math, oh, you know, and I would always say, listen, we're going to learn something, then we're going to do it. And once they had a practice to do it, you know what they'd go? Wow, that is really cool. They'd learn, they'd learn something. All right. So ask yourself that this week when you're studying, please study. Then Paul stood up to preach and motioned his hand, silence, men of Israel, those who fear God, listen to me now. Here we go. The God of this people, Israel, chose our fathers and exalted the people when they dwelt as strangers in the land of Egypt when we were in slavery. And, and with an uplifted right arm of strength, he brought us out of that slavery. Now for a time, for about 40 years, he sustained us and walked with us in all of our ways, all those ways when we were disobedient and rebellious to him in the wilderness of Sinai as we marched in the desert. Let's look at that. The use of the Old Testament immediately, do you notice it? He goes right to it. He starts telling the central story. And what does he tell us? That God delivered and God saved. There it is, deliverance and salvation. Remember that, how he, how he does the plan? And what else? He was abiding with us. His presence was with us, even though we were what? 
disobedient, rebellious. He loved us and he stayed with us. So he's encouraging the people, even when, even if we still have sin in our lives, we can get rid of that, but God won't cast us aside. He'll try to work with us. And when he, God, had destroyed seven nations in the land of Cana, so now another whole life of Joshua goes by. He finally distributed the promised land and allotted it to them by tribes. Now, that's what the kids have been learning in Bible quizzing. Okay, they've been studying the book of Joshua uh, this whole year. Now, let's look at this. Can you see the use of the Old Testament again? Can you see that there is salvation and deliverance, what, from all of your enemies all around? I think this might be a great message for the Ukraine this morning, that God is with them, that he will not leave them to their enemies, that he will deliver them. Number two, God's empowering aid comes in combat and conquest. Nobody likes to hear that. That's right, but it's true. God is a God of war. 1,642 times in the Old Testament, God destroys. Yeah, put that one in your pipe and smoke it. Okay? And I'm not going to apologize for it because when wickedness gets out of control and it won't be stopped, God stops it. Okay? And sometimes it's necessary. How do you think this country got to be a country? Wickedness was out of control. We were slaves living in our own land. We weren't, even, we were on, weren't allowed to only worship one way, Church of England. And if anybody had any other ideas about how they want to talk to Jesus Christ, they had to shut their mouth. What happened? Conquest, combat. And what happened? The people were set free. And that's what happens here. God's empowering aid in that combat and conquest to give a land, always to give land for a home. He destroyed how many? Seven, a complete number. He destroyed seven pagan nations. You want the list? Read Deuteronomy 7.1. By the way, it was read that morning. That morning, Paul was standing there. Isn't that amazing? Note, the last nation defeated by David was the Jebusites, for which the name Jerusalem, or the city of the Jebusites, has its name. And when the seventh was destroyed, the holy city was set free to become the city of God. Isn't that interesting? Lots of stuff here this morning, very rich scripture. And God kept his promise of a promised land, an inheritance, something that's ours, something that cannot be taken away. That's what the people are fighting for in the Ukraine. They're supposed to be a free land and have a free choice. And now they're being told they can't. And they're standing their ground. After that, God gave them judges for about 450 years. Okay, Paul, thank you for glossing over quickly in one sentence, 450 years. <laughs> Do you know how many prophets we're talking about here? 21, three sets of seven, ending with who? Samuel, the prophet. So there's a whole lot of history here, right? Well, what's in that? What's in all that stuff about all those judges and prophets? Well, if you read the book of Judges and you read 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel, here's what you'll find out. That God again does what? Delivers, saves. And who does he send? Shepherds to guide the people. He sends prophets. He sends judges to help. He has to help them time and time again. Why? Because they're disobedient, because they practice idolatry, because they're involved in pagan worship, because they're rebellious. Does that sound like the today or what? Anybody look around you and all you see is sin? I do. You know why? It's a world who's forgotten about what? God. What would you expect? It's not, it's not condemnation of the people who live around us, but what would you expect? If God goes out of the equation for 50 years, what do you think happens in its wake? God provides prophets to tell people the time is short. That's what I'm doing this morning. I'm prophetically telling you the time is being shortened. To redirect people away from sin and back towards what? Holiness, righteousness, and serving who? God. That's what we need to do. We need a revival in the United States today. We need a revival in Canada. We need a revival in South America. We need a revival in Africa. We need a revival in Europe. We need a revival to break out while this war is breaking out. We need a revival in China and Asia. 
God was faithful for 450 years. 400 in Egypt, 40 in the desert, and 10 destroying those nations and crossing the Jordan River and getting the land. And then he's faithful after that with all the judges for another 450 years. Notice how much is packed into what Paul is saying. How much history are we talking about? And sometimes when you're talking with somebody, you got to find out what they know. Like somebody said something the other day in the grocery store about the Ukraine. And I said, what do you know about that country? And they tried to tell me. And I said, did you know about the Holodomor? And I had them look it up on their phone. Because you know what's great about phones is you can find just about anything. And I brought up a little tutorial about the war between the wars. Great, great series, by the way. World War I, the Great War, World War II, done on YouTube and done by people. YouTube doesn't even like them. They're trying to kick them off because they tell history like it is. You know, blood shared, violence, you know. And I, wa I, I said, I want you to watch this while you go through the meat counter and get in your produce. And then if you really want to talk about this, I'll be someplace over in the dairy. Do you know the person actually watched it? Do you know I saw him in the line and he said, oh my God. And I said, oh my God, right? Yeah, yeah. The horror of the Holodomor. And that's just one incident in 800 years that those poor people have had to endure at the hands of Russians. Sorry. At the hands of godless Soviet communists. I said, so the next time you're ready to open your mouth about who's right and who's wrong, understand the history, okay? If you're gonna, if you're gonna heal this, guess what you're gonna have to do? Heal a long time. The only way that can bring that kind of healing, I said, is Jesus Christ. And of course, the lady checking me out was like, yeah. And afterward, they asked for a king. Now, God didn't want him to do this. But he gave in. And for 40 years, this tyrant Saul ruled over the people. Let's look at this one. God provides an earthly king fully knowing his people only want one so they can be like all the people around them. Oh, that's not a good reason, is it? Because then you become what? Like the people around you. But God is gracious and God is long suffering. And he waited 40 years for the people to try to return back to him. And when he had removed him, God raised up for them David as king, to whom God gave this testimony, saying, I have found David, a son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, not because he sinned, because he did, but because he always wanted and always carried out the will of who? There's a king. There's a leader. If you want to be a, a child of God, you know what you want to do? Carry out the will of God, even in your imperfection. Because God will even redeem that if you're willing. So when we look at this phrase, what do we see? The clues from scripture tell us that God gave them a better earthly king. One after his own heart. One that would lead them to do what? To fulfill his promises by following his will. To give them eventually an eternal king following in that line that would last forever. Right? Who's that? Who's that, huh? God uses King David as a model of sin. That's right, he sinned. As a model of repentance, he turned from his wickedness. As a model of forgiveness, he found it from God, even though it cost him even the death of a child. But he pursued holiness the rest of his days. He turned from where he was and he walked in the other direction. He walked towards God and not from God all the rest of his days. And that's what's important is how he finished. You know what? Our lives are messed up. And it isn't about what's messed up. It's about where we stop messing up and start living right. Because that's all God is concerned about is redeeming the past and redeeming our future. Amen? Here Paul adds Psalm 89 to speak about God's thoughts and plans. And please read that this week. Read Psalm 89, 19 to 29. Paul pours out about who Christ is going to be. 
He's coming. It's like a foreshadowing event that he adds to it. Because here's what he says about Psalm 89. From this man, David's seed. According to the promise from the very beginning of time, God has raised up for you, Israel, all you people of the earth, a Savior whose name is Jesus, for he will save his people from their sin and set them free. Let's look at this scripture, and it's our last one. God uses the descent of the house of King David and the tribe of Judah, where his promise always was, the birthplace in Bethlehem, the city of David, his descendants, Joseph and Mary, to fulfill the eternal promise in the fullness of God's time. In the fullness of time, Paul says, God brought forth a son from a woman born under the law. Right? There it is. There's the New Testament kerygma, the New Testament story. And so the use of the New Testament from here on out, the New Testament story, Paul will switch to the second part of his plan when we see each other next week, God willing. So let's go back to our question to finish. Can I identify, that means you, on your own, can you identify more points to share with others when you evangelize this week or in the future? Can you go back over this stuff and pour over this stuff as I have done and look for clues? And then the big question, can I review the notes above about how to share the gospel, the good news, and can I incorporate it? Can I learn? Can I study Paul's outline? Can I study the words Paul uses so that the very next time the Holy Spirit prompts me in the produce line speaking about the Ukraine, right? Isn't that crazy? Huh? Did you hear about the whole of Demore? I wasn't going to dwell on the whole of Demore. I was going to use that to do what by the time I got to the checkout? Who's going to save? Jesus Christ. See, you got to have a plan. Boom, right? Show them the whole of Demor and switch it for the gospel. The very next time the Holy Spirit prompts me to share that gospel, I will be prepared. I will be more effective and I will lead the lost to faith and repentance. And believe me, about 18 people had to listen to that conversation because we were two and a half rows apart. And you know how loud I can be? I'm obnoxious. Think Paul was? Bet she was. Because you know what he said? I'd prefer to write to you because if I get there, I'll chew you out. Just paraphrasing. All right? Listen, folks, this is your opportunity. Study 13 like you've never studied it in your life. God wants you to. Trust me, he's been on my heart about this. All right? This is your opportunity. Study, study, study. Ask, ask, ask. And if you ask, God will give it to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door shall be opened to you. Only do this, seek his righteousness over you, and all these things will be added to you besides. Praise be to God. Look what my wife brought me. <laughs> Would you all stand, please? For... Let's end on something a little more lively. It would be great if you could all clap along with this. So we could leave on a lively note. Dave, whenever you're ready. Jehovah Jireh, my provider, his grace is sufficient for me, for me, for me. Jehovah Jireh, my provider, his grace is sufficient for me. My God shall supply all my needs.
According to his riches and glory, he will give his angels charge over me. Jehovah Jireh cares for me. Jehovah Jireh cares for me. Jehovah Jireh, my provider, his grace is sufficient for me. Jehovah Jireh, my provider, his grace is sufficient for me. My God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory. He will give his angels charge over me. Jehovah Jireh cares for me, for me, for me. Jehovah Jireh cares for me. Jehovah Jireh, my provider, his grace is sufficient for me, for me, for me. Jehovah Jireh, my provider, his grace is sufficient for me. My God shall provide all my needs according to his riches and glory. He will give his angels charge over me. Jehovah Jireh cares for me. Hey! Shalom. <laughs> Have a great day, everyone. Be blessed. Let's say this benediction together. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. Amen. Amen. I know I shall see in his beauty The king in whose law I delight Who lovingly guardeth my footsteps And giveth me songs in the night Redeem, redeem Redeem by the blood of the Lamb Redeem, redeem His child and forever I am By the blood of the Lamb, redeem, redeem, his child and forever I am.